Good afternoon and welcome to the Smart Grid Educational Series for July 2013, live from IBM Innovation Center in Foster City, California. This is Erfan Ibrahim, and we have a group of people here in the room, and we have over 35 people who have logged in online, and over 100 people have registered. So I'm looking forward to an interactive discussion with all of you uh, this afternoon. The purpose of this presentation is to go back to some basic principles. It's the stuff that we all learned as we were going through high school and college, but in many cases we just memorized to get a good grade and then we moved on to bigger and better things in life. But unfortunately, all of these basic principles of physics and engineering don't go away just because we move on to other things. And they come back uh, in very interesting ways when we're trying to design things or recommend technologies to solve particular business problems. If you saw the overview that I sent that prompted this uh, seminar, I spoke about how the Energy Independence and Security Act has facilitated the creation of a large public-private partnership in the electric sector to the tune of several billion dollars in the United States alone. And there are similar efforts going on in Canada, Europe, Asia, uh, Middle East, and Africa. With this much money coming in and so many people of different backgrounds coming in, it's important to have what I call a level playing field on knowledge base. Because until you're not informed on basic principles, it becomes very difficult to pose an argument. A person, One person will say, we can have high amounts of penetration of renewable energy on the grid and still have a stable grid. Another person will say, no, not that's not the case. So you really have to go back to the physics and engineering principles on which you would integrate renewable energy. And we should not look at information technology as the panacea. Information technology facilitates the movement of information from point A to point B. It facilitates the interpretation of data. But it's not going to help you violate a law of physics or an engineering principle. It's just not going to happen. If F equals MA, force is mass times acceleration, force is mass times acceleration. IT is not going to change that. So we should be careful about how much we rely on Moore's law and the semiconductor technology to think that somehow we can jump across this chasm from going from the traditional grid to this modern grid that we're envisioning with high amounts of renewable energy in there. And that is the reason why I decided to do this presentation, just so that we can visit some of those basic principles and then think about how we can integrate renewable energy to the grid in a stable manner. I'm going to do another presentation in a couple of months where I'm going to get more into the smart grid applications, talk about in more detail about control voltage reduction and about distribution automation in general and about control theory. This one is a primer to that. It's to prepare you with basic physics. So with that, I'm going to now tell you a little bit about myself. I have been out in the industry for about 26 years. I finished a PhD in nuclear engineering from UC Berkeley in the late 80s. And at that time, fusion was getting a lot of attention in, from the Department of Energy as possibly a source for bulk energy in the 21st century. There was a very strong initiative to do experimental work at the Tokamak Fusion Test Reactor in Princeton. There was the Doublet 3 in General Atomics down in San Diego. There was the Alcator C, which was a test reactor out of MIT. 
that was then moved to Livermore. And then there were a variety of other smaller tokamak facilities. Tokamak, the donut-shaped fusion reactor concept, produced the highest levels of the confinement time for fusion, and that's why there was so much interest in it, even though the physics of it was relatively unstable. And to this day, it is causing a problem for us. Well, fusion turned into confusion as the funding dropped from a billion dollars a year down to 270 million. And the rest, as you know, is history. <clears throat> Today, we are part of what's called the International <laughs> Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor Study, which is happening in uh, southern France. And uh, it's a joint effort internationally. But that was my passion. That's how I got into this field, because I wanted to have uh, contributions in an area to produce a bulk source of energy for the entire planet. It wasn't just for industrialized societies or for a particular area. It was global solution. And I think that the combination of fusion power with desalination is really the future holy grail, where we can convert large amounts of salt water into fresh water and then provide irrigation to feed the growing population of this planet. Uh, we are chronically short on water, and energy is connected to water in a very big way. So after a career in fusion, I moved into teaching for a while and then got into information technology in the mid-90s, and I managed the western backbone of the Internet, which Pacific Bell used to manage right out of the Bay Area. We had very large FDDI rings here in uh, Palo Alto and Oakland, and we had ATM switches, and we had the entire traffic from the Pacific Rim countries coming through this fabric and then over the ISPs across the United States. So this was a major network. So I went from knowing nothing about TCPIP and networking or anything like that to eventually going from help desk all the way up because I had to retool myself and then manage this network operations center for Pacific Bell. It was an incredible experience to be on call 24-7, 365 and have VP level people from MCI and AT&T and others calling you because the line was down. And back then we had DS3 clear channel lines 45 megabits per second. We were dancing in the streets. Now, that was high bandwidth. So we, I went from that experience to managing network management for Pacific Belt. So this was providing remote monitoring capability. And you can see how this resonates with Smart Grid today, how important that aspect is, where you have a polar and you send out feelers, and then you get information back from devices. And from that, you make decisions on whether you want to reroute the traffic or what do you want to do. We had over 5,000 sites that we were managing remotely. I went into Newbridge Networks from there and worked on ATM. And that was a competing technology with gigabit ethernet. Basically, Cisco was driving gigabit ethernet, and we were trying to drive ATM to the desktop, which meant that we could have 155 megabits per second OC3 line coming straight to like graphics terminals and things like that, which required high bandwidth. The ATM technology was amazing, and many of its features are included today in the MPLS uh, protocol uh, in terms of guaranteeing certain amount of bandwidth for different applications. So it had a concept of average bit rate, constant bit rate, variable bit rate, and you could set time-sensitive traffic on the ATM very efficiently. From there, I went to an application response monitoring software company called Gyra out of the UK. They had gone public and back then when blind men could get jobs as night watchmen. This company's stock went from like 60 cents to $19 in six months. And it was an amazing experience learning about how do you set up service level management agreements uh, so that you could manage websites, you could manage applications as a service provider for customers. 
So the problem was that ping was the only utility people had, and that didn't really give a good measure of the response time to applications. The end users would complain because it was actually the delay was in the application server and not in the pipe that took you there. So this was an opportunity through Jira where uh, in the Java runtime environment, we could have multiple threads and run synthetic transactions that would allow you to measure the response time at the application layer, at the TCP layer, and at the network layer with simultaneity. And that was the key difference between SNMP-based tools, which were user datagram protocol-based protocols that, were, that had a little bit of play in their time because it was a connection-less service. This was a TCP-based service with guaranteed uh, response. So you could, with multi-threading, get the timestamp on all three layers and identify where the bottleneck was. Was it in the application? Was it in the TCP layer? Where was it in the network layer? So this was big. And other competitor products were like Vital Signs, which Lucent, I believe, bought out, and Firehunter from uh, HP and other products were in the market. So then from there, I realized that as I was visiting various CIOs of large organizations in financial services, healthcare, telecom, government, that the challenge that we're facing in our country is that we have IT people and then we have business people. And there are some people who can spell both, but that's about it. So in that situation, the problem was that we were having difficulty aligning our IT goals with our business goals. People would have a budget in the IT department to go buy a bunch of things that they thought were important, and somehow they made the application work, but the end users kept complaining about slow response. But the networking people had no issue with that because they said, our pipes are clean, and they would show a report. So there was this disconnect. So the reason why I started the Bid Bazaar LLC was to provide some guidance to the IT people to tell them what the business people need and for the business people to know what the limitations of IT are so that somehow we could come to a middle ground where the goals are aligned and that there's a roadmap and that there's a process by which you procure technology that meets a business goal. So that's the main reason for the Bid Bazaar, and that's why I call it a digital marketplace you know, of ideas, because it's not just about buying and selling of products. It's really how the products integrate into the organization and how can the end users, who are the final arbiters of any organization, get the most out of it. And then I had an opportunity to work at the Electric Power Research Institute for about four years, and many of you who are on the call in here know me from that experience, having worked with the NIST Smart Grid Interoperability Roadmap Project in Phase 1, and then uh, leading the NESCO project for DOE on cybersecurity. Since 2011, November of 2011, when I left EPRI, I've been helping primarily academia, some federal agencies, and some utilities on, again, aligning their IT goals with their business goals as it pertains to smart grid. And that's where I am today. I am helping one of my clients is CITER Corporation, and I'm helping build their energy practice out to complement the work that's already going on by companies like IBM, Accenture, SAIC, and others to provide solutions to the people who are now implementing smart grid technology. So they have a roadmap of some kind. Now they're trying to implement. So they need some advice on how to sequence the technologies. So that's the background that allows me to know a little bit about physics, a little bit about math, a little bit about IT, just enough to get into trouble. The agenda for today is that I'm going to talk a little bit about how electricity is generated. Now, this may sound very elementary, but it is really that elementary. There are some basic laws of physics that govern the creation of electricity when things move, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to talk about both AC and DC generation, and then I'm going to talk about how electricity is transmitted over the wires. 
and get into the concept of RLC, resistive inductive capacitive circuits, which is what we have today on the grid, and then talk about these three phases of AC power. We talk about AC power, we talk about phases, but we don't quite know exactly how it all works. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And then I'll get into grid stability, which is a critical issue, especially when you have variable sources of energy and you have a two-way energy flow. That makes the issue of stability even more important, where you don't have those reserve margins uh, to allow for the variability to be absorbed. And then talk a little bit about how solar and wind will affect the stability of the grid and what can we do to mitigate that, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. The most popular way of producing electricity in the U.S. is you burn some fossil fuel, and that process is exothermic, so the enthalpy, uh, the delta H from the chemical reaction as the bonds reorganize themselves, is released in the form of heat. That heat then warms up some kind of fluid, usually water, to turn it into steam, and then the steam with its pressure turns some kind of a turbine. That's at the high level. In nuclear fission, same thing happens except instead of a chemical reaction, you have a nuclear reaction where a neutron will come and hit a nucleus of, let's say, uranium-235 and split up into lighter elements, typically barium and krypton, and there are two or three neutrons with very high energy that are released to the tune of 200 million electron volts, and then there is some process of slowing them down, and as they slow down, they produce heat, and they become the neutrons for the next cycle of the fission. And that heat then again warms up water to turn into steam and then the turbine. So those are two popular ways of producing electricity. Here is a diagram of a coal-fired power plant. So again, you see the coal coming in. There's some kind of furnace. It produces heat. And then there are these tubes that carry the steam to a turbine. And the turbine is connected to a generator. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the generator and how it produces electricity in just a second. But I wanted to show you some of these pictorial diagrams so, so you can see how the various types of plants work. Here's a natural gas power plant. Again, there is a pipeline, the gas comes in, there's a combustion chamber, and then there's a turbine that's connected, which turns because of the steam. It can also be some kind of gas. It could be a carbon dioxide or some other gas that heats up and drives it. It doesn't have to be steam. A biomass problem. This is becoming very popular, especially in rural areas with a lot of waste uh, that is coming out of the crops or from the dairy, and that allows you to produce biomass, which can then be put into a combustion chamber. You can gasify it or you can use it in liquid form. There are various forms in which you could burn it, and then the rest of the stuff follows. And then here is your nuclear power plant. Everything you wanted to know but were afraid to ask. Uh, here, what we have is a containment building. That's the little arch that you see. And inside, you see a vessel, which is right there in the middle, in the green. And then you have control rods that are inside the vessel. And the control rods are basically neutron absorbers. So as they absorb the neutrons, they reduce the flux of neutrons and therefore the number of reactions that can occur in the next generation. So think of fission as a series of generations of fission, right, of nuclear reactions. And each one produces a generation of neutrons. So if you have control rods coming in and absorbing those neutrons, then you will produce less power in the next cycle. So you can adjust the control rods and based on that, you can adjust the power level. And by the way, Chernobyl, the reason why there was the accident was because they were testing how quickly they could yank the control rods out and see how quick the power surges could be. 
Now, you can imagine there was very little regulation there. They could pretty much do whatever they wanted because the government asked them to get them some results. There was no concept of safety of their own citizens, let alone all the neighboring citizens. So what started was the, this heat excursions from the power excursions set a chemical fire. And that chemical fire raised the temperature to the point where the inside the vessel melted. So you have a chemically induced accident at Chernobyl. So it became a nuclear accident, but it started off from thorough mismanagement. And then there was no containment building. So now, as this radioactive material is being atomized, it's also coming out. There's no shielding to keep it inside. And that was the tragedy of Chernobyl. It was never meant to be run like that. I, the analogy I give to that is like taking a car into a farmer's market and putting a brick on the accelerator and letting it go. And then saying, oh my God, cars are very dangerous. Well, yes, they are very dangerous if you put a brick on the accelerator and put it in a farmer's market. But there are ways of running a nuclear power plant, and I am pleased to say that in the United States, including Three Mile Island, there has not been a single fatality in the nuclear industry. And the reason is we follow very, very strict guidelines on how to run nuclear power plants. And if you follow the report, the Rasmussen report on Three Mile Island, you will see what a high level of neglect caused it and how the design absorbed all of that neglect. For two days, there was loss of coolant accident, which could easily have been turned off by pressing a button. But there was no nuclear engineer with a bachelor's degree on site the entire weekend of March 29, 1979. My advisor was the head of the Rasmussen report uh, at UC Berkeley. And when you get to know the details, you realize how far we were from where we needed to be. But I am pleased to say that the nuclear industry has done a remarkable job in the last 30 years to address a lot of these issues. And this is why 21% of our energy today comes from this source of energy. All right. And you see there's, there are three uh, cycles here. There's a primary cycle, which is what's called hot. It's like the radioactive, a lot of the water there is radioactive. Then there is a secondary cycle that has the turbine, which is somewhat radioactive, but not completely clear. And then there's the third cycle, which goes to the cooling tower, which is completely clear of radioactivity. And that's how this whole system works. And the heat is extracted and energy is produced. The nice thing about a nuclear power plant is that there's no carbon dioxide being produced here. There's a nuclear reaction, and it's producing heat. There is a radioactive waste, but I think that with a better fuel cycle like thorium that can breed and having reprocessing and breeding capability, uh, we will reduce the waste problem significantly and have plentiful source of energy. It almost becomes a renewable. I won't call it a renewable source, but it almost becomes because of the breeder. Now let's talk about mechanical energy converting to electricity. We talked about the thermal ones. So there are two of them. One is the hydro power plant. In the hydro power plant, you're essentially using the potential energy of the water in a reservoir as it comes down this inclined plane into the, where the turbine is. Just the mechanical force of the sliding water turns the turbine, and that produces electricity. It's a very, very passive system, if you think about it. It's just using gravity, because rain stored the energy in water to a higher elevation. And by having this reservoir, we have a higher level than another level, and there's a river on the other side. Now, you can imagine what this does to the marine life you know, with having this turbine and having this flow. But the people in the hydro industry have found ways of either directing the fish to other ways uh, and to avoid going through this because they won't be able to survive if they went through this. So there is an environmental issue uh, around hydropower because you have stagnant pools of water and there are diseases and things you can get from stagnant pools of water. 
but there are many, many mitigations that hydropower plants are providing. This is a very, very old way of producing electricity. And it is, I believe, around 7% of our energy mix today. It used to be greater, but uh, natural gas and, of course, renewable are taking on a bigger and bigger percentage as we move forward. So here is mechanical energy directly converting to electricity. No chemical reaction. Then in the wind turbine, here now the force of the wind, and the force of the wind occurs because of pressure differences in the atmosphere. Again, it's like an inclined plane, but it's an inclined plane of air as opposed to water. So I don't see much difference between a hydropower plant and a wind it's except for the form of the fluid that's going past the turbine. Again, this rotates the turbine, which is connected to the generator, and that's how electricity is produced. This is becoming more and more prevalent in along the Rockies and in Texas and other areas of the United States where there's a lot of wind. The challenge, of course, with wind, as it is with a lot of solar, is that where it is produced is not where it's consumed. And so it's already impacting a transmission system that in many places has bottlenecks. So we have to think about how we can get around that. And one topic that I will cover in my September talk is going to be on microgrids and how microgrids can help reduce the burden on the transmission lines. Yes. Could you make it full screen? Yeah, sure. So now let's talk about physics. <laughs> Maxwell's equations, this is about a little over 150 years ago that it was the characteristics of electromagnetism are very neatly defined by these four equations. I, and I've given you them in the point form, or we, what we call the differential form, or uh, on the right side, the integral form. The integral form is the one that freshman physics and freshman engineering classes use, because it's easier. A lot of students don't know enough about vectorial calculus to figure out what a divergence, a gradient, and a curl is. So the first one, the curl of H. H is what's called a magnetic intensity, and it is the magnetic field strength divided by the permeability, mu zero, which is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7, I believe. And the first equation turns into Ampere's law. This is the law that allows you to measure the magnetic field around a wire that's carrying a current. Now, if you take this equation and you take the curl of this. This del cross is a differential operator called a curl. If you took the curl of this equation on both sides and go through the derivation, it leads to the d'Alembert wave equation. And the d'Alembert wave equation is very elegant because what it does is it equates a second order spatial derivative with a second order time derivative. And solutions of that come in the form of e to the i m phi, or sines and cosines, because using Euler's uh, equation. So based on that, we understand fundamentally why electromagnetic waveforms are in sines and cosines. Have you ever wondered why aren't they triangular, or why aren't they square? Why are they sines and cosines? So this differential version, when put a curl on, and then run through a derivation, and th this used to be a homework exercise in an electromagnetic theory class to go derive this. And so that's, there's a lot of physics there. The second one, which is Faraday's law, basically says that if I have a conductor and I'm cutting magnetic lines of field, of flux, I'm going to induce an electromotive force on the conductor. That's Faraday's law in its basis. And the second equation says that E is the electric field, B is the magnetic field strength. So the time change of magnetic field strength, how would you have a time change of magnetic field strength if the conductor is cutting across the magnetic field line? And that produces a voltage, which is the, what the left side of this equation is. The third one, 
is the principle on which when you have like a conducting sphere, the charge remains on the outside. There's no charge on the inside of a conductor. And this equation shows that that there is no displacement vector. D is epsilon E. E is the electric field. Epsilon is the permittivity of free space. I think 8.85 times 10 to the minus 11 or something like that. So when you take the divergence of D equals rho, rho is the charge distribution. So what you're saying is you don't have any charge inside a conductor because there's no displacement vector inside the conductor. It's completely empty. And that's why if you see how electromagnetic fields work around conductors, they stay on the outside. They don't go on the inside. This equation, if there's no charge inside, there will be no displacement vector. So what happens is as a result of Coulombic repulsion, all the charge goes on the outside of conducting surfaces. They try to be as far away from each other as possible, which means that the inside remains without charge. That's the third equation, Gauss's law. And the fourth one about the non-existence of monopoles basically says if you have a north pole, you're going to have a south pole. So if you did a volume integral of the divergence of B, you will see that it will go to zero because it's a conservative field. All right. So now we have these four equations that form the basis for all of electromagnetic theory that we, we are using today. And I'm going to move now to how electricity is generated by using these laws on those turbines that I was talking about. So when the turbine turns, the turbine is connected to coils. These coils exist in three bunches around the circle. They're 120 degrees apart. So as the turbine turns, the coil turns, there are magnets on either side of these coils. So they're creating a magnetic field. That magnetic field is getting cut by these coils. It's a conductor cutting, Faraday's law says, a voltage is created. Voltage is created on the conductor. Because there's resistance in the wire, current will flow. But when the thing turns, after 180 degrees, the current will go in the reverse direction because now it's cutting the opposite way. So this is the basis for alternating current because the current goes one way and then after half a cycle it goes the other way. Now if you had three pairs of these coils that every 120 degrees something is cutting perpendicular to the magnetic field line with the maximum. So you essentially create three waveforms that are 120 degrees apart. And those are the three phases of electricity that we know. And the whole grid is all about tapping that energy coming out of the generator and carrying it. It allows you to use very little conducting material to carry a lot of power. And I'm going to show you in the delta and y configuration about three phases in, in a few minutes. But just understand that one of Maxwell's equations, which is Faraday's law, of induction of electricity is the basis for how all these generators work. Magnetic field lines are getting cut by a conductor. It creates a voltage. The voltage creates a current. That's the current we get out of the generator. And here it is in a diagram. And you can see how the coil is turning, and you've got these magnets, and it creates the sinusoid. Why does it create the sinusoid? Because it's only the perpendicular component of the magnetic field line that will produce voltage, not the parallel component. So think of it as a cosine, right? So when it's horizontal, it's cutting maximum because the field line is, is going like this and the conductor is moving down it's vertically. So it's 90 degrees. So cosine of zero is one, that's the maximum. And then as it goes to 90 degrees, it becomes zero because now it's parallel to the field. And then it goes back to maximum, but negative. So that's why it follows the cosine or the sine, depending on which phase you want to take. So understand the basis for this sinusoid is the rotational motion of the coil in the presence of a magnetic field that is producing voltage from Faraday's law of induction, which is one of Maxwell's equations. And some people jokingly say, 
and God said, and then there were four Maxwell's equation, and then there was light. <laughs> and I've seen that quote many times. Yes? Um, so the electromotive force, when it's basically parallel, it's basically, there's no force being used. Exactly. And that's why the voltage goes to zero periodically on the sinusoid. And when it's negative, it means that the coil is just going the opposite direction. But by having, think of it like this, by having these three sets of coils, you're not creating a jerky motion. You're creating a very uniform motion because it's always some coil that has force on it. And that is very important because the rotor angle and the alignment of the electromotive force with the torque is very, very important for grid stability. We're going to get into that also. Today we're going to talk about everything that you were afraid to ask. And notice, there, I haven't talked about zeros and ones. There are no routers and switches here. <laughs> And it's very interesting. I, I feel like I'm giving a seminar on floods and Noah is sitting in the front row. I mean, we have people like John Tengen from IEEE and others who are like amazing experts in this area and they're sitting on the call learning from me. <laughs> it, it's, it's an interesting uh, experience to go through. Yes. Yeah, so here it's maximum because the field lines are going uh, between the poles and the conductor is moving in a perpendicular direction to it at, in this configuration. So this is where the maximum current would flow in this coil. When the coil is... Zero. No, voltage is maximum here because it's moving perpendicular to the field. But when it becomes vertical, then the conductor is moving horizontally at that point, and so there will be no cutting of the magnetic field line. Right? In this, it's maximum because it's going down perpendicular to the field lines. It's parallel to the field line right there. No, the motion is perpendicular. Motion. Uh, it's cutting. All right, good. Yes. <laughs> and then when it becomes vertical, then it's going parallel to the field line, so it's not cutting. So that's the sinusoid. Once you get this visualized, the generators are no problem. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about photovoltaics and how they produce electricity. Then magically, you know, you put the solar panel, some guy comes, hooks it up, and suddenly you have light in the house. What's going on? Well, what's going on is that silicon has four electrons in its outer shell. And so it likes to bond with four other silicon and create a crystalline structure, just like carbon does. However, if we dope the silicon with boron and phosphorus, if you do it with phosphorus, you have an excess of one electron because phosphorus has five electrons in its outer shell. And boron has three electrons in its outer shell. So you can do what's called N-doping with phosphorus and P-doping with uh, boron. So when you put these two together and create a substrate, you create a slight migration because the excess electrons of phosphorus will want to go and plug the holes that boron has created on the other side. And that, as it moves, establishes an electric field between the two sides of the substrate. And that electric field essentially blocks the process. So now, you take this substrate and you expose it to light. The photons will come and hit the electrons and eject them. And if you create an electric circuit on the outside and connect the N side with the P side, the electrons will flow around from the N side to the P side and form an electric circuit. And if you put some load, it will actually do work through it. If you put in battery, it will store the charge in it. And that's fundamentally how it works. And I'm going to show it to you in a diagram now. Here it is. So you have the N type silicon and the p-type. The n-type has the excess electrons, the p-type has the absence, and you see the electric circuit on the outside connecting to the two. Now if you have multiple of these, you just get more power, which is the next diagram. There we go. See how each of those panels has the substrate? And they put a non-reflective coating on top to make sure that it doesn't just reflect and go away because you want to have maximum absorption into the 
thing. So here is a photoelectric effect. And there is um, what's called Compton st scattering that occurs. So you have a light coming in, and it ejects the electron, or puts it essentially from the valence band into the conduction band, and then it carries it. Now electronics, the way semiconductors work, is very similar to this, except electricity is driven there. Here, it's an optoelectric effect. And here is a real system. We have an array, we have a, some kind of a controller, it's connected to the batteries, there's an inverter that can turn it into AC. Remember, this is producing DC voltage, and if your house runs on AC, you still need an inverter. That's why we have inverters with the photovoltaic, because this is, of all the sources I've spoken about, this is the only one that produces DC voltage. All the others, as a result of the rotation, are producing AC. And then they need rectifiers to turn it into DC. Here we need an inverter to convert it into AC. So at this point, let me see if uh, how we're doing. Uh, it says, for the generator field, it is a DC current to create the electromagnet, not AC. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, moving along. The next one is, how is electricity transmitted? So we have two options for electricity transmission. We either can run it AC across the wire, or we can run it DC. Now, in AC, essentially, the direction of electricity is changing in the North America 60 times per second. That's why we have 60 hertz. So when the voltage is negative, basically the current is moving in the other direction. And then when the voltage is positive, it's moving in the other direction. So we, we have the swing back and forth between positive and negative as a result of the rotation. So that produces alternating current. And the reason why we have been using alternating current as the means of transmitting electricity is because we could use very simple transformers with primary coil and secondary coil and induce a higher voltage and step up the voltage and lower the current and run it over long transmission lines. That helps reduce the loss. And that is what I'm saying in this slide, is that the I squared R, the current squared times the resistance, or in this case the impedance, if the I is low, then the losses are less. So what you do is you step up the voltage and you reduce the current in the transformer. So that's a way of transmitting. Now, with technology having improved with uh, DC uh, transformers, we can now also step up the DC voltage to very high levels and run it on high voltage DC. And China especially is doing a lot of work in transmitting energy over long distances using DC. Uh, we have DC connects between our large interconnects. So between the Eastern and the Western and ERCOT, we have DC buses. And what that helps do is decouple those regions from each other. Because you don't want there to be some kind of beat where there's a variation in the frequency between the two causing grid instability. So the bus is, uh, or the interconnect between the, the big sections in America is done with DC to decouple. All right. Then how is electricity transmitted? I'm going to show it to you in a diagram in a second, but essentially you have electricity being produced in a generator, then there's a step-up transformer that takes it to very, very high voltage, and then it runs over a transmission line to a substation where it's brought down to a certain level, and then it's put on a distribution set of lines, feeder lines, that go out all the way to the pole in front of your home or shop or business, and then it is distributed to your home. And here's a diagram that shows you some of the voltages and the levels at the different points. This kind of system is a just-in-time system. 
So you are putting electricity on the grid as it's being consumed. You don't want there to be a discrepancy between the supply and the load. If you have that, it starts affecting the voltage as well as the frequency. So you have to make sure that you have very tight regulation on both the voltage and the frequency. And this is why there has to be a control system here. So there has to be feedback constantly that tells you what the voltage and, and phase and current situation is to maintain stability in the grid. And oscillations, there are small, low mm -hmm. oscillations and large oscillations. And the purpose of all these independent service operators out there with their uh, tools by which they monitor the grid is to ensure that those things don't get out of bound. So there, there's proper feedback that allows you then to make adjustments. And phaser measurement units for bulk transmission systems are a very important way of getting that idea of what the voltage, current, and phase is. So you essentially have phasers, which are voltage and current vectors that you get a very good measurement on many, many times per second. And then you feed that back to know how stable the grid is. But it, this is essentially the key components of the grid all the way from generation to a home. Now let's get into a little bit about resistive inductive capacitive circuits and talk a little bit more about what is all this reactive power and apparent power and imaginary power? What's all this about and how are they all related to each other? So the first thing is that there's a concept of impedance, which is like resistance, but it is resistance with induct inductive and capacitive elements in a circuit. If there weren't any of those, the impedance would essentially be the resistance. But when you have inductive loads and you have capacitive elements on the grid, you have a concept of impedance. And I'm going to show you in just a second what that formula looks like. But the phase angle, which is the angle between the voltage vector and the current vector, is critical. That needs to be as close to zero as possible on the grid in order to maximize the transfer of power from the generator to the customer. The more that is off, the less will be the effective power that you're going to give. And the rest goes into warming up the atmosphere, basically. So you don't want that. So you want the phase angle to be as close to zero. And I'll explain in a sec how we're going to accomplish that. So here are some equations and the circuit diagram. So you see how you have an RLC circuit. This is the simplest one, which is just a series circuit RLC. And you see the AC source on the left, and you see the inductance L. The C is the capacitor, and R is the resistor. And we have a resonant condition where the capacitive element and the uh, inductive element cancel each other. Notice that how the capacitive element is negative on this axis and inductive element is positive on this axis, which means that in an inductor, the voltage is ahead of the current. And in a capacitor, the voltage lags the current. And I'll explain to you physically how that happens. If you have an inductive coil and you're running an AC current through it, by Ampere's law, you're going to create a magnetic field that will be varying in time because you're running an AC current through the coil. So you have a conductor and a changing magnetic field that's going to induce an electromotive force. But according to Lenz's law, this electromotive force is negative. And so it's creating a resistance to your change. That's what Lenz's law says, that nature resists change. So that's why omega L is the reactance, inductive reactance. And notice, the higher the frequency, omega, the more omega L will be. So that means it'll resist more the faster the change you want to bring. So keep that in mind. And why is the voltage ahead? Because the voltage induces the current. So that's why the voltage is ahead of the current in the inductor. Now, let's take the capacitor where you have two plates and you're carrying charge from one plate to the other and that separation creates the voltage between them. So this is why the voltage lags the current because you have to run the current first to create the separation of charge in a capacitor. And again, 
if think of it like this, if there was no variation of current back and forth, you'd essentially have a break in the circuit. The capacitor plates will act like a break in the circuit. But because the current goes back and forth on, in the limit as omega goes to infinity, it's as if there was a short in the wire. So that's why the capacitive reactance is 1 over omega c. Now, you have a positive element omega l from the inductance, and you have a 1 over omega c negative contribution from the capacitance. If they were perfectly offsetting each other, there would be no reactive component, and you would just have a purely resistive circuit. That is resonance in an RLC circuit. And that's the holy grail. In the grid, the reason why we have capacitor banks is because we bring them on as inductive loads come on to offset the omega L of the inductive motors by putting the 1 over omega C to cancel it. And that's the basis for all of this real-time balancing. And this is a type of ancillary service. This is a kind of what we call VAR support. And we're going to get into that in just a second. Let's look at this triangle. You see how the impedance times the current is the vector going along the diagonal on the, on the triangle. The apparent power is the, is the voltage times the current directly. The voltage meaning IZ, IZ meaning the impedance. So current times the impedance is the voltage, and the voltage times the current is the power. So the apparent power, which is measured in kilovolt amperes, is on the complex plane. It's, it's the one on the diagonal. It has two components. It has a real component and an imaginary component. The real component is the real power. That's the power that we measure on meters. And then the imaginary power, or which is called the reactive power, is measured in volt ampere reactance. And that's the VAR that you hear about. So this triangle basically shows the three quantities and their relationships with each other. Now, if there was no inductive or capacitive elements, in other words, they cancel each other out, then there would be no VAR there. It would be zero there. The vector will be perfectly aligned with the horizontal axis. But because there is a component, you see the voltage vector tilted slightly, the total voltage vector above the x-axis. So by looking at an RLC circuit and looking at these components, you begin to understand why, as the angle phi gets larger and larger, the real power gets smaller and smaller, because the horizontal component of that line gets smaller and smaller. And that's not favorable. We want this line to be as close to horizontal as possible, so that we can get maximum power transfer from the generator to where it's being used. So when you hear about VAR support and you hear about real power versus imaginary power, it's all around this diagram and this concept of an RLC circuit. <clears throat> now let's talk about the three phases for AC power. If you see the diagram at the bottom left with the power source, and you have those three coils, and they are generating voltage and hence current in the coils, and they're 120 degrees apart, they're going to create the three phases, and that's the three phases that you see. And then there are two additional wires in this five wire, five wire configuration. You have a neutral, and what the neutral does is it allows current to flow between the phases if there is a, a difference, and that's the neutral line. And then the ground is just ground with the ground. So these many transmission lines will carry these five wire configuration. There are two ways in which the three phases are set up. It's either the Y configuration, which you see on the top, and the delta, which is the one in the bottom. This is the two ways, and I'm going to show you how you tap the voltage off of these two configurations in the next diagram. So notice how the three sinusoids are 120 degrees apart, and you see how the taps are there for each of the phases from the generator, because there are three pairs of coils. 
Notice how there are three pairs in the diagram over there? So as they're turning, every 120 degrees, one of the coils is cutting. Okay? So then, moving along, these are the voltage readings from the two configurations, the three-phase with the Y and the delta. And you can see how they're tapped. The, when you have a home, most homes have two phase. And the two phases are delivered to the home 180 degrees out of phase. So that allows you to have 110 or 240. You have to pay a lot of money and go through a lot of bureaucracy to get three phases. <laughs> Some people have them in their homes, but most people have just two phases. All right, so now let's get into some ideas about grid stability. We were talking about it on the margins, but the key thing is that you, you have a just-in-time network and you want to make sure that the generation that is put on the grid, the power that is delivered on the grid, is meeting the requirements of all the loads that are on the grid in real time. If there is variation, if there is more load than generation, you will see the voltage sagging in those situations. So you have to bring on other units, and that's why we have peaker units available that when suddenly there is uh, unannounced increase in demand for electricity, we could bring in those natural gas peaker units. If we had storage, we could bring that on. Also, like if you have a lot of solar and wind, and the cloud cover comes and suddenly a solar farm is out of commission, we have to do something. So there are multiple things that we can do to do the balancing, and we're going to get into that. But the key thing is to balance generation and load, and also the transmission lines have a certain rating. There's a certain amount of power that you want to carry through them because there are ohmic losses. There's heat produced. And if you run too much power and the heat is created, heat causes expansion that causes sagging. And in many cases, what, what can happen over time is that the transmission line, the material, will age and you will have more maintenance issues. So you don't want to put too much burden. So you're, it's an interesting balancing act where you're balancing supply and demand, but you're also gauging how much you're running over the transmission lines. And this is where I believe distributed energy resources can really play a good role, is that if you have local control, you can create autonomous zones, if you may, of the grid that are basically sufficient during the peak times uh, because they have solar and wind and some storage maybe, or they can activate a demand response program and shape the uh, load during those times. So that combination is going to be critical as we put more and more renewable energy. But renewable energy in some ways makes the transmission issue worse, like when it's highly concentrated in Texas or in the Rockies or other places where there's lots of wind or in the southwest where there's lots of sun and you want to carry it. But in other situations, it can actually help by being a distributed energy resource and not burdening the transmission line where it can be locally consumed. So now let's talk a little bit about voltage, phase, and frequency. So voltage is a measure of the electromotive force. Uh, when I was telling you about the conductors cutting the field lines, so that sets the voltage. The frequency is based on the speed of the rotation of the coils in the magnetic field, because that creates the frequency of the sinusoid. And the phase is about where the waves are relative to each other. So the, there can be phase shifts that can occur as a result of introducing some inertia into the system. So as the electricity travels, if there's a capacitive element or inductive element on the wiring, that can shift the phase. So th there needs to be some correction of that phase uh, at the substation. So those corrections are done. That's why we have uh, these phaser measurement units that help you determine 
what the phase is at the end of the span. If you didn't have that measure, you'd be guessing from where you're putting the electricity into the system. So that's not good. So the more diagnostic information you have, the better you are. And what we're trying to do in the electric grid, at least in North America, is increase the concentration of these sensors that can measure the phasers. Because as we collect that information, we can regulate it better. And then, of course, you want to make sure that you don't have large fluctuations. So for instance, the generators, the people who are responsible for generating electricity are constantly monitoring their generators because there is a, a clock on the grid. Now there's a sinusoid, the 60 hertz, and people have to follow that if they want to inject electricity into the system. If you start injecting it at different times and you're not in sync, then that can cause instability. So we want to make sure that the clock mechanism works for all entities that are coming in. Also, there are predictable loads and unpredictable loads. So the predictable loads, there's a certain pattern they follow every day and the utilities know that certain times you need so much power. Then for the unpredictable parts, that's where they have the reserve margin. They have other ways of dispatching when it's needed and it wasn't predictable. But if we go razor thin on the margins, then we are in trouble if those variations occur unless we have some very effective demand response program that can send a signal out quickly and turn things off. And the debate continues in the industry on how effective that is going to be going forward. I think that a combination of storage and demand response together was probably the way to go. We talked about solar and wind. Solar energy, especially in a farm where a cloud cover can come, can drop precipitously, even if it's only for a few seconds. But that energy has to be covered somehow. So if you had storage, you could turn on the store, or it could offset the intermittent aspect. Uh, it's very hard, especially with the kind of graphs I've seen of solar power from individual farms, to do demand response that fast. <laughs> Uh, so I think that there may be some cumulative effect, like for instance, if you had multiple solar farms that were delivering, then it would e you know, even it out a little more, and then you could follow a demand response program. But if it was very, very fast, I think that that would be a problem. So in those situations, you have to have reserve spin available to deal with that. Uh, with wind, you have wind situations where in the early evening, have you seen how quickly the wind can drop? It'll be like blowing really hard and then within 45 minutes, it's gone. So if that is in the evening when people are coming home and they're turning on a bunch of things, then that's just the opposite effect, right? And at night, late at night when the wind starts howling again, everyone is asleep and not using electricity. So once again, we'll need storage and we'll need demand response. All of these things are going to be important as the percentage of the overall mix uh, that solar and wind represent will grow. And each of the utilities that I have been in touch with over the last five, six years are very actively involved with renewable energy integration because their states are now legislating that with renewable portfolio standard requirements. And the question is, does the engineering live up to the policy? And I think that is work in progress. And different states have shown different levels of success in integrating it. Mm -hmm. Europe has done it to a higher extent, like Denmark and other countries. Uh, but I think part of the issue in the US is also the distances and the complexity of our grid. So. I'm looking forward to a good discussion on that subject uh, at the end of this. So how are we doing on time? Well, yeah. Oh, okay. But uh, we are from many days is that we have someone who has booked the room immediately following this to a PM. Oh, okay. So we have to be out of here at that point. Okay. So. At this time, we just are at our Q&A and discussion point. So what I'll do is I will look at the questions and comments 
online. And meanwhile, the people here in the room can also chime in. Okay. Let's That's it. These are. This is our presentation. So. All right. Let's see if there are some questions. So if you have questions online, feel uh, free to post them. Yes. So I think Ray Hayes says for the generator field, it is a DC current to create the electromagnet, not AC, and then don't forget the I in IWL and, oh yes, yes, yes. So I had been writing the components, but in vector form, uh, you would put the imaginary unit vector I, and that's what Ray Hayes is talking about. Um, other questions, let's see how many people are still on. Oh, we have 75 people on. So uh, I'm looking forward to some questions from all of you. I, it can't be that I answered all your questions about <laughs> physics, or did I put people to sleep? Any questions from the audience online? Let me ask you a question really here. Is yes, yes, me? please. Um, so what is the time you have to react between discrepancies in the demand and the supply of power? Uh, it's, you know, it's immediate, how, because it seems that um, the two really need to be in sync, even if you have peakers who can be called upon quickly in terms of, well, when compared to other sources of power. Sometimes I have the feeling from your explanation that it needs to be a near immediate adjustment. So well, when we talk about immediate, I mean, there are things that have to be done in seconds. There are things that have to be done in minutes, and there are things that need to be done in an hour or so. Okay. It all depends on what the situation is. Mm -hmm. But the, there are levels of seriousness of things. So for instance, if you need to tell a protective relay to do something, you need to do it very fast because that can lead to and un not just unstable, but potential fire or things like that. So that, I believe, around 40 millisecond type times, uh, Chris, I, for, so that's like a... That, that you know, kind of number. Yes. Yeah. 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 So it like, varies a little bit, plus or minus, mm -hmm. yeah. but you know, that kind of number. But on the dispatch for electricity, for demand response type stuff, you can tolerate in tens of seconds, even minutes, uh, depending on how much uh, reserve spin you have. And also, uh, there are things that you can do, and this is, very, this is why it's very important to move away from a heavily radial configuration to a more network configuration. Because the more network that you have in the distribution network, the more you can play routing games of how, which segments are you going to use to energize which homes? Because in some areas you may have excess power available. And by reconfiguring on the fly, you can take care of an immediate issue. This is where the distribution of power joins the whole information networking again. Yes. That's where they, yes. they merge again. Exactly. So you have uh, seven questions. So, oh, we have, we have several yeah. questions coming up. Seven. Seven? Yeah. That's awesome. All right. I <laughs> knew he asked questions. <laughs> oh, Irene says, what happens when phase information from PMUs is forged? <laughs> <laughs> That's hacked. <laughs> it does get hot. <laughs> Literally, it gets hot. Uh, but yes, so this is a real issue that you don't want the monitoring of the grid to be tampered with. And the integrity of data is very important, and this is why a lot of emphasis is being put on establishing security controls for 
the IEEE C37.118 standard for phaser measurement units. And I believe that that should, okay. I, if there's someone on the call who knows where those security controls are being specified, because I know that IEC 62351 has it for 61850, but I don't know where IEEE C 37118 security controls are. I didn't know if there are any. There should be. There should be. I'm not sure they started that yet. Okay. So, Irene, you, you have a very good point, and the integrity of the data. So, w what is happening to It's not like it's all happening in clear text. Don't get me wrong here. Uh, companies like Cisco and others that are developing the IP networks are using, are using standard IP security services like TLS and IPsec and things like that. So that's going on. But what controls are there within the protocol itself? I have not heard yet. But ultimately, we will need what I call uh, application layer addressing in much the same way we've done it for smart metering and we've done it in uh, substation automation. I think, Rafael, I think what you're seeing is there are bits and pieces of it scattered across the various standards and standards bodies, but there is nothing that has brought them together in a single place and focused on them, which is what really needs to happen there. Yes. Yes. But it is critical because that can throw off our correction mechanism. So we want to make sure that the phaser measurement unit data is as accurate as possible. Not only do we want it frequently, but it needs to be accurate. And it could be done on purpose to cause a certain yes. wreck in a certain way. Yes. So things like checksum can help, you know, make sure that the data is, uh, has integrity. All right, the next question is, you mentioned households are rarely provided three-phase AC power. What is the benefit of three-phase power in normal home? It is just that it provides a higher voltage. What household appliances may require that? Well, I think with electric vehicles, it would be very nice to have a three-phase charger. Basically, it means you can get the 480 volts, uh, but you can also get more power. Power is the critical thing here. I think, I think the answer to that is partially that except for electrical vehicles and except for people, for those of us who may have like woodworking machines or something yeah. in their garage that, that work much more efficiently with three-phase Three. power, you don't really need it Correct. in your average home. There are no appliances that derive any benefit <laughs> from it. Your lights are not going to get to use it because they're all 110 volts. That's, that's right. Yeah. So in case you didn't hear Chris's comments, uh, essentially there are not that many applications in a home that would use three-phase or they're even rated for three-phase. But if you were doing some amazing woodwork and the machine <laughs> ran better with three-phase, yes, a drill maybe or things like that. No, no, it would be like a big power saw or a big planer. Oh, that needs solved. continuous power as that it's need, turning. That, that are more efficient because they're turning at a high rate of speed and need that continuous feed. Okay, very good. Uh, yes, uh, Can you Andrew. Can a little bit about the substations and capacitor bank and how much they have to regulate the load on the grid? All right, so the purpose of the capacitor bank is not to regulate the, the load, but to offset the inductive component on the grid because of motors. Uh, and the inductive motors are becoming more and more prevalent. And so the capacitor banks are essentially there to offset the phase angle because the inductive motor starts throwing it off the real axis. No, the phase angle. So essentially the real power becomes less and less and the apparent power is there. So the imaginary power, the reactive power, uh, consumption is going up. And and that doesn't turn into effective mechanical power uh, at the end system. So in order to maintain an efficient grid, we want to maintain the phase angle as close to zero as possible. And that has to do, this is one aspect of power quality. And so that's what the capacitor banks are for. And, and they're not only kept at the substation, but they are along the distribution system also. So in an industrial zone, you would need more substations than capacitor 
So it all depends on who is doing the balancing. If, if it's a regular domestic household, you shouldn't actually need that much. On, okay, so on the homes, uh, there are companies that are offering products now that can do real-time balancing. Well, getting back to Chris, he was saying that there's not many things in the home that need... Well, that was for three phase. Yeah, not not because of capacitor banks. Two different... Two different questions. Two different questions, yes. Okay, so the next question is, uh, Rashid says, can you... Can your presentation be accessed for students and engineers at different locations? Yes, I'll be distributing these presentations so you can take them on to other people that you want. But it would be nice to have them sign up uh, on the distribution so that I can invite them to future events. The next question is, can you talk about how the laws are impacted by two-way power flow challenges from the edge about instant versus delay islanding of a microgrid and about DRS capacity. Good question from Andres Carval, former CIO of Austin Energy. The two-way energy flow, as far as Kirchhoff's law is concerned, it applies whether you have one-way or two-way flow. So when you go around a circuit, the sum of all the voltages still adds up to zero, and all the current going in to a node and coming out of the node are equal because there's no collection of charge happening in any piece of the wire. Having said that, what happens the way energy flows is there are areas of high energy and there are areas of low energy. So the areas of low energy are where the loads are, typically, and the areas of high energy is where the sources are. Mm -hmm. And essentially, energy flows from high to low. Now, if the, on the low side, enough power is being generated, it can shift the tilt so that the energy can flow this way now. So that's all that is happening in real time. What needs to happen is that with the use of sensors, you let the electrons go where they need to, but you monitor them with sensors on voltage and current and phase, and if the equilibrium is going off, then you take corrective action by reconfigurations, by using switches. So that's essentially the game. It's a balancing act mm -hmm. where the energy will flow according to laws of physics to lower energy areas. Whether it's one way or two way doesn't matter. But you have to monitor it if it's two way because you never know because of the transient behavior of the two way what could happen to the grid. It's not like the passive system we used to have where the hydro nuclear coal was just pushing all, electricity. All single direction. All single direction. From high to low. And then the next question is about instant versus delayed islanding of a microgrid. Okay. A microgrid is what you would call a voluntary islanding. So you think of it as a, a so bunch of sources of electricity. It could be solar. It could be biofuel. A variety of things that are happening, let's say, on a campus or at a building level. And then you have some loads. And then you have the ability to get on the grid or off the grid. So if you have a peak demand situation and the signal came to you, you can disconnect and for a while use your indigenous resources to provide the source of electricity until it's okay to get back on the grid. So that would be a case of voluntary islanding. Now that can happen in a very quick way. A signal comes and you get off because you've done your assessment and you say, I have enough electricity to carry me for my critical functions. Or it could be over a period of time, like they say, over the next three hours, get ready because I need you to be ready when I tell you. And then you make preparations. So that's the instant versus delay. It's all a function of, on the microgrid, how many resources do you have at any instant to balance out your loads? Now. Microgrids can also act as ancillary service providers, and they can prov provide VAR support from their solar and from their storage to the grid when it needs it. So you can do both things. The nice thing about microgrids in general is that they divide up a huge problem into many little problems that people can solve. That's the key thing. Now, if the policy side 
can catch up with the engineering side, we will be great. In other words, if there was the ability for microgrids to buy and sell electricity with each other. That's the holy grail, and we're not there yet. And that's why we are in this ironic situation where the technology has gone way ahead compared to where the regulations are. And I hope that we can move in that direction because, in my opinion, having distributed energy resources and not trading at the area or feeder level is like tying your hand to your back and saying, let's eat. So I hope that in the regulatory uh, side of the business, we can move the transactions of energy purchases, you know, the energy markets, down to what I call the area level between substation and feeder level. Once that happens, then microgrids are going to be truly enabled. We're not seeing the best of microgrids the way it's configured in today's regulatory framework. Okay. So thanks for that. And DRS capacity is as good as DR gets, that's how much capacity you have. I mean, it's, it's that way. And my recommendation is that if you understand human behavior and you understand inertia in humans, then you know that when you design a demand response program, make sure that there's plenty of redundancy in it. <laughs> <laughs> so that you can offset the inertia of people. Even though they signed up and they said they're very excited and they'd love to save 25%, what may be going on, on the, in their house on that given day can make all the difference. So you don't want to deal with the variation of human emotions and behavior. Create redundancy in the demand. So if you need 10%, Subscribe to 30% so that you can get that 10%. But the problem is that as renewable energy becomes a greater and greater part of the mix and demand response becomes a bigger and bigger part of the overall client base, redundancy will not be a luxury because there won't be enough capacity to have redundancy. <laughs> that's scary. And that's why I believe that there's a certain amount of bulk energy that will always be needed. We cannot just completely go to distributed energy research, given that issue of the intermittent aspect of renewable and the impact it will have on DR programs. All right. The next question is, does the inclusion of intermittent renewable increase or decrease the need for spinning reserve? I think it, in, it increases the need for spinning reserve, in my opinion, even though they want to go to razor thin margins, but the intermittent aspect of renewable energy, if it is done in the way it is done today, if we move to microgrids, we may be able to lower the reserve spin. I don't think it's really the inter it's partially the intermittent nature of the of the distributed energy, but what what it really is is the speed at which the intermittent changes yes. from available to unavailable. The partially available, whatever, that's what drives the need for spinning reserve. Because right. if you did, if what didn't move so fast, then you could use a standard peaker that's just waiting and have time to spin it up and, and supply whatever that you needed. But right. since, as you say, with the wind, it can change. Very dramatic. Minutes, yeah. A cloud can come over a solar farm. You got to have it standing by almost instantaneously. Yes. Yes. Storage. yes. Yeah. So that becomes a bigger and bigger problem the larger percentage that renewable energy becomes. So the answer is yes. We will need more reserve spin if we have more renewable energy that is intermittent because of these fast transient uh, behaviors. Do, do you spinning reserves? I guess the demand. Uh, my imagination dictates something that spins. Would uh, storage like batteries be the same? Battery health solution. It, it could be, assuming that the battery has the capacity to actually address whatever the need is. Yeah. When the sun, the cloud comes over the solar farm, or the wind quits blowing, or yeah. whatever, yeah. and for the duration of yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, for short-term things, almost for sure it does. It might buy you enough time to spin up a standard peaker rather than having it spinning constantly. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So you're buying time with a battery, maybe yeah. more than that's one strategy yeah. for buying okay. time cool. potentially. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, essentially, reserve spin all the time is wasting of energy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you think about it, it's just energy being wasted. 
However, you do it just the same way you keep firemen uh, in a fire department for that one time then there's a fire or the ambulance people for the time when a patient needs to get to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So a lot of overhead is there to maintain overall stability. Yet you have sprinklers in the room so you don't have to involve them all the time or keep very large amounts of firemen. Well, uh, I hope are, that that's not the method we use. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but the reserve spin, I mean, <laughs> you're, you're right in, in the concept of a reserve spin. Think of it like a flywheel almost, mm -hmm. that it's spinning and there's a moment of inertia on the wheel and there's a certain amount of rotational kinetic energy that could be tapped in an instant. Yeah. So we have to move along. We have a few more questions here. Uh, then uh, from... All the data we're collecting, which is the most sensitive, i.e., if it is forged, where do we have the worst consequences? What kind of consequences? Okay, so we are continuing the subject on, uh, on phaser measurement units, I believe, from Irene Gasco. Uh, I think the key thing here is that you have to have sensors and you have to have the experience to know what a normal mode of operation is so that if the integrity of data is violated and it is leading to anomalous behaviors on the grid, that there be a normal mode of operation by which you can compare and then take corrective action and say, I'm not going to trust this data because it's bogus. This is not how it normally is. So what you have to do is literally create ranges of operation for your key parameters and know that it's falling within those parameters so that you don't trust data just because it's coming from somewhere. It has to fit within what you'd call normal range of operations. And this is something domain experts can help in each of the areas, transmission, distribution, and generation, all of them. All right, the next question is from, in hotter climates with technology advancements in photovoltaic generators, Will it be possible for homes to be self-sufficient and not be required to connect to the grid? Mm -hmm. I think that this is a real issue. It has to do with the fact that it's only at best 12 hours a day. No matter how hot the region is, how clear the sky is, the question is what happens to the rest of the 12 hours, especially given a society that's moving to increased electrification and enjoying leisure when the sun is not there? <laughs> and especially in hot climates, this is a big thing, especially now with Ramadan, if you go to the Middle East, the electricity is consumed mostly at night, not in the daytime. <laughs> it, it really, the question, it, I would want to see more context in the question. Are we talking about individual homes? It's where hard. I, where I know yeah. people who live off the grid right yeah. now, and they have battery storage or yeah. something that allows them to, to function at night, or are we talking about something that's going to power Los Angeles or right. one of the largest uh, cities? This question is referencing an individual home, especially in warm climates. I think that storage can only take you so far, and then it becomes a little cost prohibitive. The people who are literally off the grid, they don't worry about their ROI. They just are technology connoisseurs. They wanted to prove a point. They went and bought a big battery, or maybe they use electricity at the, in the daytime because they're very disciplined and they don't need that much storage. Whatever the case may be, or they may be living like John Muir, you know, right? So, <laughs> so th there's tremendous variability, but I think that uh, there will still be a need for the distribution company to provide electricity during certain times of the day in order to keep the electricity affordable to the customer. Uh, the combination of photovoltaics and storage, even with the current trends of prices going down, it's still going to take several years for there to be a return on investment, you know, like what you'd call equal to what the grid is giving you. So. Let's see, it depends on the rebates that the individual states give and, and the argument that each one makes for or against going off the grid. But I don't think it's a, it's a weather issue. No. <laughs> it's, it's more about is there, what is your usage pattern in well, the home? There, there is a weather factor. Um, I own property on coast, in coastal Oregon. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's just not possible yeah. to do solar anything there during the winter right. period. Yeah. Because it's cloudy all the time. 
Yeah. Okay, I could do passive solar heating perhaps, but nothing that requires sunshine to get to a solar collector or something like this, because there just ain't enough sunshine there during the winter. And I'm sorry, but I've got to call time where we've uh, run out of time on the meeting rooms. Okay, so just uh, in conclusion, uh, there will be talk on storage uh, coming up. Uh, we will have someone uh, who is very knowledgeable on energy storage systems come in a couple of months. I'm putting that together. Uh, our next talk is going to be on energy efficiency, uh, and it will be given by Ami Amarnath of the Electric Power Research Institute. That will happen on August 13th, which is the second Tuesday of August. Mm -hmm. And at this point, what I'd like to do is end this uh, webinar slash seminar because of time constraints. But if you have questions, uh, continue to communicate with me by email. I will be sending out this presentation and webcast recording in the next couple of days. And I thank you all, and I hope that this was uh, instructive and educational. At this time, I will end the recording. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You very much.